We are in the second week of a series from 2 Timothy that we're calling In These Last Days. And we're calling that because Timothy, Paul speaking, the Apostle Paul speaking to his disciple Timothy, as we'll see next week, is writing to Timothy specifically because he believes there are some crazy times ahead. And he wants his young disciple, who's now leading a church himself, to stay faithful to stay on that fast, firm, narrow road to lead others to stay faithful, as we'll see this morning. Last week, we were celebrating Milestone Sunday as we prayed over uh, the young babies that have been born this week, but then also that very significant celebration as we were able to pray over and celebrate the graduates of 2023, those who have been in school for these last 12 years, some of them maybe longer, I don't know, Right? That's, that's your story. But we're able to celebrate with them this very significant milestone. And, and the Apostle Paul was celebrating with Timothy, his young disciple, a milestone to some degree as well, and wanting to challenge him to think through some things as he was ready, preparing to take that next step in life. And just real quickly as a review, some of the things that he was challenging Timothy to do was to continue to fan into flame the gift of God, what God has put inside you, Timothy, and all of us as well, what God has placed inside of us, that spark that he wants to become a flame, fan it into flame. You be intentional. And we talked about this last week, the reality that fanning a spark into flame requires time, intentionality, and focus. I talked about those survival shows, and maybe you've watched that, where, where you see somebody gather over top of this little fire, this little ember that's becoming something more. You see the smoke coming, and then finally it starts to glow a little bit, and then it sparks into flame, and then you start to add all these other materials, these resources to it, these sources of fuel, so that it can become something more. And that is the imagery that the Apostle Paul is using as he's speaking about Timothy's faith and our faith as well, as it begins with this little spark. But Paul's hope for Timothy and God's hope for all of us is that our faith becomes a roaring fire that is nearly impossible to put out. Maybe you've been at that place where you've been camping at some point in time and you, you've lit this fire, you've got it going really well, you're down by a lake, you go down to the lake, you get a bucket of water because it's time to put the fire out, you pour that bucket of water on the fire, you notice it's still hot, so you go down and get another bucket of water and you come back and what's happened? The fire is going again. Because fire that is roaring is hard to put out and that is the hope that the Apostle Paul had for Timothy and then I think even the hope for all of us who are disciples of Jesus now 2,000 years roughly later. And so beyond that, the Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to know what God has put in you, that spark that he wants to become a flame. God is working to guard what he has already put in you. Timothy, you guard it too. Be intentional in your pursuit of God. Be intentional in your prayer life. Be intentional as you read and meditate on the words of Scripture. You guard it too. You nurture that spark so that it can become a flame. And so we're going to continue this week in this second week of this series from 2 Timothy in these last days. And as we do, just to get our minds kind of thinking about what Paul is going to be telling Timothy, I want to ask you a question that goes really along well with what we're celebrating today, Mother's Day. Are there in your family any generational traditions? Maybe something that's been passed on from generation to generation, and maybe you don't even know how many generations this tradition goes back. You know, often our mothers are the ones responsible for passing these generations down. I don't know if because maybe they're more sentimental as we, you know, as we dads are sometimes, but, but certainly the truth is our mothers often pass these down, especially when it comes to things like this, right? Maybe this will get you thinking a little more. Things like family recipes. And sometimes we could take that last admonition that Paul gave to Timothy because some of you ladies are guarding these family recipes like it is that spark that God has put in you. I've seen it before. We had a lady in our church in West Virginia and she would, she would sort of share the recipes that had been passed down from generation to generation in her family, sort of, because she would always leave out those one or two ingredients that made it really special. And so you'd go to make it and you'd say, well, why is this just not as good as what she's done? And it was because she 
had left some stuff out. She was guarding that recipe tightly because it had been passed down from generation to generation. I mean, she could tell you the great-grandma from whom that recipe came from, and now she was a grandmother herself. So maybe you have something like that, and maybe on Mother's Day you even break out one of those recipes because it, it puts you in the mind of where you're thinking about your mom. Or maybe it's something like this, jewelry or another heirloom that has been passed down from generation to generation. Some of you, your, your wedding ring may be something that goes back in your family generations. Or maybe you have something, a keepsake, that every time you look at it, you, you remember great-grandma or great-grandpa. Or maybe it's this. My family is at times a storytelling family. And so, yeah, we've got stories that go back sometimes generations. And I love hearing these stories that go back generations. About my grandfather who fought in, in World, One, World War I and actually befriended a German prisoner of war. And they, they exchanged these things. And my dad has one of the things that they exchanged after they became friends. Pretty cool stuff. Or maybe it's, it's holiday traditions in your family. Again, whatever it is, we often have things, maybe thanks to our moms and others as well, that we pass down from generation to generation. They're significant in our family. They mean something to us. And I want you to keep that idea in mind as we jump into this morning's message because we're going to talk about Paul's call to Timothy to pass something down from generation to generation to generation. If you've got your Bibles, I'll invite you to open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 13 this morning. Let's read together. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says, again, remember, Timothy is Paul's young disciple. He is his son in the faith, not his child by blood, but the Apostle Paul sees an incredible significance in the kinship, in the family bond they have in Jesus Christ. So they didn't share biological blood, but they certainly, in Paul's mind, shared another kind of blood. As Paul realizes, the family of God, the, the, the believers who come together, the community of God, are called to be a family, bonded by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, he says, you then, my son, speaking in that familial language, Paul says, be, great, be strong in the grace that is in you, that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say... In the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So right away, Paul kind of shows his hand and says, here's what I want to talk about to, to you next, Timothy, as I'm writing you this letter. What, what Paul is saying really to Timothy is this, and we're going to explain this so that you can understand this concept. Paul says, be a generational disciple maker. I want you to take what I've given you and pass it on to someone else who will pass it on to someone else. And this is what Paul says, basically. I taught and discipled you, Timothy. So I was responsible for teaching and discipling you. You went with me on missionary journeys. Now you're in Ephesus by yourself, working with this church. And what I did with you, I want you to do with others. I want you to generationally pass on what I've taught to you. So Paul says, I taught and discipled you, Timothy. So what do I want you to do? I want you to teach and disciple others. And then I don't want it to end there. I want them to teach and disciple others as well. In other words, it could look like this. If we were to create just this little flow chart, right? So there was Paul who passed things down to Timothy who will pass things down to other reliable, reliable believers who would then pass things on to others. And I'm assuming that Paul was hoping that it would go beyond then as well. But what we see here is four generations deep of disciples who made disciples. Disciples who were becoming disciple makers. Paul was a disciple of Jesus, an apostle of Jesus, who taught Timothy and took him with him wherever he went and then said, okay, Timothy, now it's time to launch you out. Especially in disciple-making movements, they sometimes use this acronym M-A-W-N, or M-A-W-L. So you model something for someone, and then you assist as they do it with you. Then you watch them do it, and you supervise. And then after that comes the launch phase. You launch them out into mission themselves. And so Paul is saying, generationally, this is what I did with you, Timothy. Timothy. 
You came along with me, and I modeled for you. Then I assisted you as you, you were also partaking in the mission. Then I watched you. I'm observing you. But then, Timothy, I launched you out. And now you're in Ephesus, Timothy, and I want you to do what I've done with you. I want you to go do that with others. So model, assist, watch, and then launch these guys out who will then also then go and teach and pass on what I've given you to others with, I believe, the implication that this will continue on and on and on and on, which is why I believe Jesus says in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age because Jesus' hope was that this would continue Generation to generation to generation to generation. And I want you to think about this. If you're here this morning, it is probably because somebody was Paul to you. Somebody was a Paul to your Timothy. Have you been a Timothy to other reliable believers who will then pass that on to others? So this is what the Apostle Paul goes on to say then. He says in verse 3, he says, Join with me in suffering. Like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no one is serving as a sol- no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now, at first, it may look like Paul has kind of switched gears. He was talking about one thing, and now he's talking about soldiers. How does this connect? And you'll see in just a minute. The next three examples that the Apostle Paul gives all connect back to what he has just told Timothy. So again, he says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled, enmeshed in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Very quickly, if I could just summarize this in one sentence, the Apostle Paul is telling his disciple Timothy, listen, be careful not to become distracted with the things of this world. There are loads of distractions that will pull you away from what? The mission of Jesus. The call to be a disciple who makes disciples. Again, just as fanning that spark into flame inside of you takes time, intentionality. Timothy, if you're going to be a disciple maker who passes this on to the next generation, you're not going to do it without having time, patience, and being intentional with that next generation of believers. Paul's saying, look, it's very easy to become distracted. It's very easy to find something else that will take up your time, that will occupy your time to where you you feel like this thing has now got a hold on me and I'm, I'm not making disciples as I maybe ought to be making disciples. And so Paul says, listen, Timothy, like a soldier, you need to be paying attention to your commanding officer, Jesus being that commanding officer in this case, listening to him, listening for the sound of that voice and not becoming distracted by all of the other competing voices around you. Then Paul says, okay, in case you didn't get it, I'm going to give you another example. Timothy, in case that one didn't connect with you, let me give you another one. He says, similarly, Timothy, and maybe Timothy was an athlete. I don't know. Maybe he'd grown up competing in some sort of sports. You know, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Okay, real quick summary of this one as well. Paul, what are you trying to say to Timothy in this one? Here's what I think, especially as believers, we we can get to that place where we, we know what life is about. We've seen clearly, we've heard the message of Jesus. We know his words. We know his call to us, for us, in us, what he wants to do through us. But we can become so distracted that we forget what life is truly all about, that we forget what he's called us into. So Paul is really doubling down on what he said with this, the first, the soldier analogy. Timothy, you got to be listening. Be listening. Don't become so distracted that you miss the call of Jesus. And then he doubles down and says, look, just like an athlete who's not listening to hear what the rules are, you can become so distracted that you forget, you miss what life is truly all about, what your life as a disciple of Jesus is truly all about. If we use the light and dark kind of imagery in the metaphor that that is in Scripture so often. You step into the light, now you see everything, and it's amazing. Have you ever been walking into kind of maybe a a room that you're unfamiliar with, and the light is off in that room, it's nighttime, and you you go to flip that light on, maybe it's that Airbnb you rented for your last vacation, and and you don't really remember the layout because it's not your place. You don't remember the layout of that house. 
But you turn on that light and all of a sudden you see where everything is. Now maybe in your place, you could walk it by dark at night and you wouldn't stumble over things. But in this new place, you need the light to see. Well, coming to faith in Jesus is kind of like that sometimes, especially for people who've really been walking in darkness. They come to faith in Jesus and it's like a light switch was flipped on and now they see all these things. And Paul says, be careful because we can become so distracted that we walk back into that dark room. Forget, the, forget what it looks like to walk in the light and why walking in the light is so much better. So Paul says, look, you can become so distracted that you forget what life is truly all about. And you walk right back into that dark room instead of staying in the light with Jesus. Then he says, okay, in case you didn't get that, let me give you one more illustration so that you understand, the apostle Paul says. He says, listen, listen the hardworking farmer should be first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on this, these three examples, Paul says. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. In other words, Paul says, like Jesus spoke in parables, I'm going to be speaking in parables to you, Timothy, and I want you to reflect on these things. Now, let's just use the example of this last one, the hardworking farmer. Let's think about this for just a minute. I want to ask you a question. Some of you probably grew up farming land. Maybe you grew up even, you know, recently. Maybe you're, you know, younger than some folks who grew up even farming land around here. Maybe you lived out west somewhere or in the Midwest, and you grew up on a farm. And so maybe you know what it's like to farm, but I'm guessing a lot of us don't really know what it's like to farm. The closest thing you do to farming is walking down the grocery store aisle with a buggy, right? That's the closest you'll ever get. Oh, look, tomatoes. But many of us, or many people in, in, in Paul's day, in Timothy's day, would have understood this quite, cl- quite plainly, what Paul is saying. So if we ask this question, what do farmers do? Timothy would have known. Well, well, farmers start by cultivating soil. They cultivate the soil. They have to till the land. Maybe they even work fertilizer into it. They're making the soil fertile. That's what farmers do. But then they don't stop there because if they just tilled the soil and just kind of said, okay, well, now good, let's just see what pops up. They would have stopped way before a place where they could expect any results. Farmers then sow seed. So they cultivate the soil, then they come and they sow the seed, and then they watch it start to grow. Now, as it grows, a farmer's job is still not done here because the next thing they have to do is tend these plants. Sometimes it means they're going and pulling weeds so that those weeds don't take up the nutrients that are now in the soil from all the work they did to cultivate that soil. Sometimes it means they need to water a specific area of the field because it's just not holding water as well as some other areas of the field are by the natural rain that's coming. Or maybe they need to figure out another way to irrigate things because there is no rain or protect the harvest, protect the plants from bugs that would come and get in there. So farmers tend the plants, and the last thing, finally, what the the, the farmers can do is they can gather the harvest. Because a farmer's job is not done until what has been planted is gathered in. Now, I want to share with you something that a friend of mine, a guy named Josh Howard, who who leads a disciple-making movement in India, shared with me just recently in the last few weeks. We were at a conference together and and doing some, some engagements together, and so one of the things he said is what, what, what I feel like we figured out in the global church, this, the church in the south, the global south, is this, is that the, har- the size of the harvest you will see exists in direct relationship to how much seed you scatter. So he said, listen, if I had a 10 by 10 plot in my yard, and I went out and I planted corn in that 10 by 10 plot in my yard, I could expect to receive as much corn as you can plant in a 10 by 10 area. But if I had 10,000 acres in Iowa, and I went went and planted corn all over those 10,000 acres in Iowa, what I could expect to see is 10,000 acres worth of corn coming back. And he said, there's a principle in here that the North American church needs to learn. I said, okay, I'm interested. I'm listening. Tell me more. He said, well, let let me give you... Let me give you a twist on on this parable in Mark 4 about the sower who scattered seed that the first century audience of Jesus would have understood right away. They would have gotten it. 
But we often miss because we're not farmers and we just read the parable, the parable and then we go to where Jesus kind of explains the parable. But there was something in that parable that is there that we often miss because we're not farmers. So let me read the parable for you and then I'm going to share with you what Josh shared with me. This is the parable from Mark 11 or Mark 4, 1 through 11. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got in a boat and sat, sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve... The twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. Now, we see the different four different soils, and we start to think about different people who might be receptive on different levels, and some of them might hear it, be excited right away. I mean, Jesus gives this explanation right away after, these, after verse 11. I mean, he goes into the explanation. He says, there are some people, I mean, you throw it out there, they're excited about it, but it doesn't last long because Satan comes and snatches it away. There are others, they, 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 it grows up and it just, there's not enough room for the roots to really get down in this rocky soil. And the next thing you know, they start to wither. Then there are these folks, you know, he keeps scattering seed in different places. And in some places, I mean, it's, it's this idea of these, these folks who they're excited for a bit. Or maybe it even starts to spring up, but the cares of this world come. Or difficult times, troubles come. And it chokes off that plant. And that's the piece that we tend to focus on because, again, that's what Jesus explains. But what Josh said, he said what, what people in Jesus' day would have known, what they would have first been hearing is, wait a minute, what is this farmer doing? Going out and throwing seed all over the place. Because the farmer would have had a field and he would have cultivated the soil and he would have made rows and maybe he would have even worked on putting fertilizer in there. He would have prepared his field so it was ready to plant. He wouldn't have just been walking around, digging in his seed pouch, throwing seed everywhere. Oh, look, there's, there's a road. Let's throw some seed on that road and see what happens. Oh, look, a bunch of rocks over there. Let's throw some seed. Reaches back in his seed pouch. Oh, look, this isn't going to work either. Let's throw some seed over here. I mean... What first century people would have heard is, this farmer is crazy. This is a crazy farmer. He's throwing seed everywhere he goes. I mean, the, the farmer in this parable was an entirely indiscriminate sower. He threw seed everywhere and did not make a judgment about the quality of the soil. He was not making that judgment. He just said, oh, look. There's a place I can throw some seed. Let's do it. And of course, this parable is about sharing the good news of Jesus, the word Jesus even says. So we share the word and we throw it everywhere. We're not worried about, do we know the quality of that soil or not? We share the word and we throw it everywhere. So what Jesus says, the point of this really is, as it relates to sowing the seeds of the gospel, Jesus calls us to be crazy farmers, every one of us. Go out and be a crazy farmer. And then Jesus ends the parable with this idea. This right here, if you can understand this parable, is actually the secret to the kingdom of God. Can we just be honest about the fact that too often, even when we're trying to be disciple makers, we prejudge the quality of the soil into which we're planting seed? I mean, you don't, you don't know if somebody's going to be receptive to the gospel until you scatter seed and you just see. You just see what might happen. So I think that's kind of what, what Paul is saying to Timothy even. Scatter seed, scatter it broad, scatter it far, scatter it wide. 
Make sure every corner of your field is covered. And if it gets over onto the road, great. If it gets into the rocks, great. If it gets to where there are weeds, great. Just throw seed. Throw seed and see what happens because some will fall on good soil. And when it hits that good soil, Jesus says, watch out, multiplication will happen. So Paul goes on to say this. He says, remember, now he's coming back to the gospel in this. He says, remember, Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. Paul is saying this, even in prison, I am a crazy farmer. And I've got the opportunity to scatter seed in so many places. I, I'm suffering right now, yes. But the gospel, God's word, is not chained. I'm not distracted, Paul says, from the truth of the gospel. Jesus, who is the answer to generations of promises, and the only one who has conquered death. And I'm sharing that good news everywhere I go. And so now he turns to Timothy and he says these words. Therefore... I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Then Paul goes on to share what many believe is maybe an early Christian hymn, why it kind of appears offset if you're looking in your Bible, like, like a poem would, like a hymn might. So Paul goes on to say this, here's a trustworthy saying. Now here we come into the hymn or the poem, something that was memorized probably by early Christians. He says, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, Jesus even says that in his own words, and anyone that's ashamed of me, right? If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And all of this, if we read it in context, is connected to what Paul is saying. Timothy, I want you to be a generational disciple maker. I want you to grow the family of God. I want you to become someone's spiritual father. Or to someone sitting in here this morning, I want you to become someone's spiritual mother. I want you to celebrate more than your biological children on Mother's Day and Father's Day. Or if you have no biological children, I want you to invest in the next gener generation for the sake of the kingdom of God so there will be many generations of believers after and because of you. But then Paul says, look, even if we were faithless to the mission, God is always faithful because he will not forget about the people he loves. Even if we forget about our call to be disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Paul is saying God will always remain faithful to his mission, but in saying what he says, there's almost this implied question. God will always remain faithful to his mission. Will we? Timothy, will, will you, just as I passed on faith to you, Timothy, will you Pass on faith to others. Reliable people, Paul says. What he means by reliable is others who will take what they've been given and pass it on to someone else. That is the test, the litmus test for reliability in Paul's instructions to Timothy, who will pass it on to others, who will pass it on to others. You're here. I'm here this morning. Because someone was Paul to me. Will you be a Timothy to the next generation? Let's pray. God, as we think about these words, as they relate to disciple making, and, and even in the celebrating of Mother's Day today, Father, we think of all our mothers passed on to us. But Father, we know that the even more important than family traditions we can pass on to others is the faith in you, a knowledge of the good news about Jesus Christ that we pass on to others, whether it be in our biological families or whether it be outside of our biological families, as you are knitting together this tapestry that forms the family of God. May we be faithful to 
to your mission, God. We know you will never be faithless, but may we join you in being faithful, in being disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, so that we can see your kingdom grow, your family on this earth, and forever in eternity grow as well. God, help us be like Paul, like Timothy, and like those reliable others. God, make us makers of disciples. This we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Let's stand as we sing.